welcome to the Healthy Place Insta Live. I'm Kelly Close. Today we're going to find out what it's like to be a psychologist from Dr. Christy Norwood. Um, let me see here. Okay, uh, Dr. Norwood helps decrease the stigma of mental illness through her company Remind You LLC, and among the other things that they do, um, they also have a podcast, and you can find out more about that podcast by following um, Dr. Norwood. Her tag is at Dr. Christy with an I E Norwood. So please do that. And let me bring her on. And remember, uh, we always take your questions and your comments, and we would um, love to hear them so we can share them as we go on. Hello, Dr. Norwood. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you for the invite. So, I guess. First off, uh, what is a psychologist? Oh my goodness, there's so many ways we can kind of go with what a psychologist is. Um, there's different sort of areas of psychology. There's some psychologists that work solely with children as um, child children psychologists or pediatric psychologists. Um, there are psychologists who solely do research. Um, there's psychologists who uh, are industrial organizational psychologists and they help systems and organizations to um, kind of flourish and look at their processes. And then, um, like myself, there's many psychologists who are clinical psychologists. And so what we do is uh, we provide individual therapy, many of us. And so that looks like kind of sitting with someone one-on-one -on -one and talking through challenges they may be experiencing. Uh, we also are able to diagnose so, you know, you know, Kelly, for example, you may come to my office and share with me some personal information. And based on what you share, I can sort of identify, is this a clinical, what we call a clinical diagnosis? Is this depression? Is this anxiety? Um, in addition to that, as psychologists, we also offer group therapy. So where we bring um, different people with similar issues together to sort of connect. And again, to sort of learn some healthy coping skills. And the last big piece I think that differenti differentiates psychologists from some of the other mental health professions is psychological assessment. So what we are able to do is we've been trained to have a wide range of assessments that we can give to determine if there's underlying issues that regular talk therapy may not allow us to really get to the heart of. So um, a lot of times that process is long. So it might be three and four hours that, you know, you sit with someone, you give them different measures, we interpret them. Um, but, you know, in totality, what we're able to do is really understand kind of the human behavior, understand the rationale behind behavior, and then also help people move forward to getting better, to feeling better, to living, as you all do, you know, a healthy a healthy life. Well, you kind of explained this, um, but what's the difference between like what you would do and maybe a family therapist or a mental health counselor? Yeah, so I think the psych testing piece is really the, the key difference between, say, mm -hmm. like social workers and um, licensed professional counselors. You may find that psychologists are uh, specializing, if you will, in working with families and um, working with couples. And so we can absolutely do that work. I think one of the big pieces with psychologists is that we, we will have a doctoral degree in psychology. And so um, oftentimes that encompasses a lot of research, a dissertation. Um, there's typically some advanced practices that come along with um, that piece in addition to um, just kind of your master's degree level clinicians. So um, I've always heard that a psychiatrist can prescribe medication, mm -hmm. but being a doctor, are you able to do that too? So I am not personally able to do that. In some states, they've actually legalized um, psychologists to be able to gain prescription privileges. So mm -hmm. after you've gone through sort of a period of time, you're able to then go forth and get some additional training after that, after you receive your doctorate to be able to prescribe. Um, that was definitely not the norm, but I would say that that is something that's more newer to the field that's becoming an option. Well, that's, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what does it take to become a psychologist? What kind of education or training did you have? 
Yeah, a lot of time, a lot of finances, a big commitment. Um, in my case, and there's different paths, but the typical trajectory is um, completing an undergraduate degree. It doesn't have to be in psychology, but a lot of times it is in psychology or something similar. Um, and then thereafter, there's kind of two options. You can choose to complete like a term, what we call a terminal master's degree. So that may be two years or three years. Um, and then thereafter, you can pursue your doctorate degree. And so um, the culmination after all the coursework and sort of the internship placements, the culmination is an internship experience, which is kind of like um, medical school, where mm -hmm. you, you go into a system and you rank order the system, you interview around the country at accredited sites, and then this sort of computer match system happens, all of the sites rank order the individuals who uh, they've interviewed, and then all the applicants rank order their sites, and then you hope that, you know, it's a really good match. And so you complete a one year internship and then you are considered um, kind of a resident in psychology, depending on the state that you're in. And then there's a licensing exam, which is a national exam that you have to then sit for. Um, once you pass the licensing exam, then you are officially considered a licensed clinical psychologist. That sounds like quite the process. And, yes. you know, thank you for your dedication to that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So what led you to decide to go through all of this to become a psychologist? Yeah, I, you know, I think for me, a lot of times our personal experiences drive, you know, the fields that we end up in. And so for me, I saw people suffering. I saw people in my personal life really struggling, but not getting help for a variety of reasons, uh, whether it be, you know, their own thoughts about mental health care, whether it be they felt like it meant that they were weak, um, just different reasons why people didn't seek mental health care. And I always like, I'm kind of nosy. I kind of want to know the why behind, you know, uh, things that happen. And so I, I pursued a career in psychology and I didn't realize that it was going to take all these additional years of school. But as I did that, I really enjoyed it. I felt like it helped me understand some of the dysfunction that I was seeing. It helped me understand the world a little bit better. And I think most importantly, I still got to help people. So it was like, I get to talk to people every day. I get to help people live like a more fulfilled life. And I get to understand like why something is happening. So it, it kind of was just a beautiful uh, meld for me. And I think as I've gotten more, you know, into the field, just being able to see people like really recover, seeing people live these more fulfilled lives and like not allowing these kind of mental health conditions to keep them stuck has just been a personal fulfillment for me. Uh, what is a day in your life like? <laughs> well, each day is different, that's for sure. Um, right now, kind of, I'm doing some administrative work and then some clinical work. So my day kind of looks like I usually get in in the morning, I check my email, um, sort of see kind of what's happening. And then uh, from there, I usually have clients that are scheduled for individual appointments. Um, so I might see maybe two, maybe three individual appointments that are scheduled, um, usually for about 45 to 60 minutes. And then um, usually by that time, I might get a little bit of a break, check my email again, kind of see what's happening. Um, and then thereafter, a lot of times I do groups, uh, depending on the days. So I do about two to three groups a week. So I'll usually get to be able to do a group, which is always, uh, that's one of the things I really enjoy about clinical work. Um, and then I get the joy of being able to supervise future psychologists. So um, sometimes, on, depending on the day, supervision is infused in there. So we get to talk about cases. We get to watch recordings of their clinical sessions. And it helps me just kind of continue to grow as well. And then I also have a chance every day to see a new client. And so that gives me a chance to, again, like sit with someone who I don't know, kind of understand their journey, what's brought them to this point. And then, you know, the education piece is so important. So I get to do lots of outreach. I get to do lots of education about mental health. Um, I think social media um, has provided like a platform for that. So um, I get a chance to do that. And, you know, when I'm not here in the office, I also get to uh, participate and do the podcast. So I get to talk with other people about mental health and, um, you know, just an opportunity, again, just to 
provide what we call primary prevention um, and give people tools. Not everyone needs or wants to come in for formal mental health care, but there's things that we can do on an everyday basis just to help us feel well, just to help us feel healthy um, and in a good space. Um, you just said a phrase of uh, primary prevention. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. So primary prevention is really like getting enough skills. So not waiting until it's too late to go get help. I think for a lot of us, like if we think about our own bodies, like we might have a cut and we're like, oh, this hurts a little bit. Meh, it's fine. I'll put a bandaid on it. And that leads to two to three weeks and the wound is just still not healed. And so as opposed to waiting until it's time for surgery, you know, it's saying, well, you know what, let me sort of do some things in advance to keep myself physically safe, or let me, you know, implement exercise each day, or let me walk, or let me try to connect with people in the midst of COVID that I, I really care about. It's doing those things to keep yourself healthy and not just saying, well, you know, nothing's going wrong in my life, or not just waiting until something catastrophic happens to then seek care. care. It's doing something every single day to be the best version of yourself to show up as the best version of you. Well, I, I really like that. I think a lot of us could use that maybe when we yeah. were in school, you know, to yeah. get that information. <laughs> been helpful. Yeah, I think it's kind of, you know, mental health in general, I think people are just now starting to talk more about it. I think especially with like COVID-19, the last six months, people are talking more about it. But um, I know a lot of the work that I do and some of the other therapists on Instagram are doing and you all as well is primary prevention. It's getting the information out there. It's, you know, helping people read about it and understand and figure out what can I do right now today? Like you might, again, be feeling in a really good space with your mood and your sleep. And how can you continue to do those things so you can maintain that level of health? Um, so what you you're so excited about everything you do and I you know I, I love that um, it, it makes me want to come see you oh. but but what is the the most rewarding part of what you're doing that's a great question you know, I think I spent 10 years working with military veterans, which was extremely rewarding. And now I'm um, doing college student mental health. But the, the connection between the two is that I've always worked in helping people through like their transition periods, whether it's like divorce, relationships, transitioning out of the military, transitioning to college. And so I think sitting with people in that struggle and like watching them sort of come in um, in this sort of space of like, despair and the space of like I really don't want to be here and the space of uncertainty so that part doesn't allow me a lot of joy but I think sitting with them in the journey and then the joyful part is like when they've been able to do the work to get to a place where they're feeling better and they're like hey doc like I got relationships I have friendships I'm going to school um or like you know I get to see even when they're in that space of like you know despair or, or deep depression I can still sort of see the light and I can kind of hold that for them until they can kind of get there and so that for me is extremely rewarding um i mentioned groups and i think sometimes people shy away from groups because they're like i don't want people to know my business but i love <laughs> groups because you know you get different people who are oftentimes like apprehensive about being in a space together and people getting to know them and mm -hmm. like the power of the connection between those people is just amazing and i've just seen really um a lot of growth happen from people being in groups and and being able to like receive things from other group members who they may have never interacted with if it weren't for that group experience. Um, so what is the most frustrating part? Yeah, so I think one of the things that's frustrating is when people want to get mental health care, but they are unable to, you know, whether it's lack of resources or lack of information, I think that can be frustrating. Um, I think sometimes, depending on the system that you're in, there's sometimes constraints around what you're able to do. Um, this isn't the case at our college counseling center, but for example, some institutions might say students can only get five sessions. And so you may, you know, get to a point with someone and their insurance might run out or um, they may not be able to afford care anymore. Um, and so I think some of the like systemic issues can be frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, but I will tell you, I think the the benefits outweigh the frustrations. And that's for me, because this is really hard work, um, as is therapy, that's for me is what keeps me going.
That's another thing I wanted to ask you. Um, people often say that therapy itself is hard work, you know, yes, going to therapy. And why is that? What does that mean? Yeah, I mean, I think all of us want to be, for the most part, you know, we want to feel comfortable. We don't necessarily like to be outside of our comfort zone. We're kind of socialized. If you think about social media, you post a picture, what do you want? A whole bunch of likes, right? A whole bunch of follows. Like, that's just kind of the world that we live in right now. And so therapy is kind of the opposite of that in some ways. So it's kind of like going to a trainer who's uh, forcing you to kind of look at yourself in the mirror. And there may be things about yourself that you don't like. There may be things about yourself you might be 50 60 70 years old that um, you haven't dealt with that occurred back when you were 10 or 11 and so those sorts of things that happen part of the process is hard because I'm going to ask you and other providers will ask you to sit with like uncomfortable thoughts and feelings and like talk through those things and we are not socialized to be uncomfortable we are socialized to be very comfortable and to sit um, and joy and things of that nature. But oftentimes it's an uncomfortable process. And so I think that's what makes it hard. I think also just time, like many of us are just busy with whether it's you're working or whether you've got a family or just other responsibilities. And so, you know, it is a time commitment. You know, it's kind of like everybody sets these New Year's resolutions and then it's like, nah, I don't have time to go to the gym or I don't have time to save that extra money. Let me just spend it. And so it's a it's a huge commitment. And so I think for some sometimes for people, they say, yeah, I want to feel better. You know, I want to be better. I want to work through this trauma that happened, you know, way back when. But then when you get in there, you realize that the work is a little bit harder while it's very rewarding. You know, the work um, sometimes can be harder than I think a lot of people imagined it to be. It reminds me of uh, when something's going on and somebody asks me how I am and I just say, I'm fine. Right. We, we don't, or I don't really want to sit there with those feelings and talk <laughs> about them. So I guess therapy would be really good for something like that. Absolutely. It draws it out. Absolutely. So uh, Misty asked, how do you know if you've found the right psychologist or therapist? Oh, I love that's a great question, Misty. So I think the first thing I want to say is that sometimes it takes, you know, more than one person to find kind of the right fit for you. It's kind of like a new pair of jeans, right? Like, sometimes mm -hmm. you got to go to different stores in order to find the, the pair that you really like. And so I, I would say one, you feel comfortable, but I would say give it more than just a session. Sometimes, you know, on the first session, but Sometimes the angst of just being in a new relationship is uncomfortable. So when mm -hmm. you're sitting with that person, if it's someone that you feel like um, you can actually open up to and you can actually be what we call vulnerable with, someone that you can be honest with, then I think you've found um, the person that is a good fit for you. If it's someone, so sometimes if you go to like a physician, they might say, do you have a preference for a male or a female? And depending on your issue, you may not want to see you know, a female, right? You may not want to see someone from a certain cultural background. And so I think you have to sort of figure out like, are there trigger buttons for me that are going to cause me not to open up? You know, whenever I see someone who wears blue shirts, you know, is that a trigger for me? And I, am I not going to be able to talk to that person? And if that's mm -hmm. the case, then you don't want to work with that person. I found um, psychology today, and you all may have some information as well about different providers. I found now like it's awesome. You can go online, you can look up providers and you can kind of, you also can like see whether they're on Instagram or Facebook, you can kind of get a feel for their personality. So, you know, mm -hmm. for me, when I'm thinking about a therapist, that's a good for, fit for me. Um, I want somebody who is like warm, somebody who is open, um, someone who's direct, but not like too in your face. And so, you know, that fits for my personality. So I think part of what you can do is sit down and say, okay, what kind of person, if I had to sit with and talk to them about my problems, like, what kind of person would I want them to be? Man, woman, um, you know, would I want them to be younger? Would I want them to be a little bit older than me? And sort of, then you have, part of it is just having the bravery to walk in the room and it could be that the person looks exactly how you wanted them to look and it's a great match, but I don't want anybody to be discouraged if you end up in therapy and the person, um, the first person you meet is not the best fit, right? And, and it's okay to say that, you know, all psychologists, all therapists are not created equal. Right. So um, you've been 
a professional for about eight years. I think you said you graduated in 2011. Mm -hmm. So that's a long time of listening to <laughs> people's problems and yeah. issues. Yeah. Does it affect your mental health at all, your physical health? You know, I, I think it does. I think to say that it doesn't would probably be a disservice to, I think, the people that I sit with, especially my background is doing a lot of work with, like, trauma survivors. So um, in the past, it was a lot of veterans who, you know, served in combat zones. Um, currently, I work with students, some of whom have experienced different types of trauma. And so that does, it weighs on you. It impacts, you know, how you see the world. And um, I know I picked up a lot of things from the veterans that I've worked with, even just, you know, the way that I kind of see the world, whether or not I wash my back, just a little bit extra, just things that they were trained to do, I sort of have um, kind of vicariously picked up. And so what we learn in graduate school and what I really try to practice is that, like, I have to take care of me. So when I leave the office and I'm not with patients, like, I just, I'm just Christy. You know, like I get to do fun things. And I think for me as a psychologist, like my patients are a mirror. I love I love working with people once you get that rapport because they come in and they're like, Doc, what's going on? And you're like, how do you know something's happening? Because we're human <laughs> too, you know, like right. life happens to us, COVID happens to us, um, social unrest, all kinds of stuff happens to us. And, and so we're dealing with sort of life circumstances as well. But I think what my patients allow me to do is like they hold me accountable. And, and I don't mean that, you know, it's, it, they become my therapist. I just mean, for me, part of my values, I can't sit with you and you're sort of sharing, you know, everything about your life. And I'm um, supporting you in that journey and saying, hey, you should, you know, make sure you take care of yourself, have healthy relationships. If I'm not doing that stuff, then I'm being hypocritical. So by sitting with people, it gives me the accountability. Um, and then again, as I said, you know, once you get to that space, with particular clients, they can be honest with you and say, okay, you look a little different today. Is everything okay? And that's, that's okay to acknowledge too. You want a therapist who's going to be like open and honest as well mm -hmm. with, with appropriate boundaries, of course. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So one last question. Yeah. Um, traditionally uh, people of color and maybe minority groups in general kind of shy away from talking about mental health issues or reaching out for help, um, what can we do as a society, you know, to help bring people out, you know, to help them feel like it's okay to share? Yeah. You know, I think the first thing we have to do is share space with people that are different from us. So obviously, as we kind of share this space, there's obvious difference differences in terms of uh, race and culture, right? But even between the two of us. And so I think it's really important that when you have people that are different from you, that you share those spaces and not being afraid. Because when you don't, you have this side sort of saying, well, I think they should do this. And this side saying, um, I want them to do this and never shall the two meet. And so right. I think that's the first piece. The second piece is, is being okay to ask questions, right? So if you have questions, for example, when, you know, some of the recent social unrest happened, I had several of my white colleagues who contacted me and they were sort of like, I don't know what to say, but like, I just want to like be there for you and sort of support you in this. And that was really meaningful. And so whether it's race or religion or sexual orientation, I think it's important to ask those questions and to ask people how, um, how can I support you in whatever experience that's going on? And I think the other piece is to make sure that you are culturally competent. So for providers that are out there who are serving patients or not, I mean, even if you're not doing mental health work, whatever work you're doing requires mm -hmm. you to be culturally competent. And so that might mean reading, uh, that might mean going online, that might be talking to a client who, or a colleague who is of a different background. I know if I get someone that comes in the, a room with me and they have a clinical diagnosis that I'm not really familiar with um, doing a lot of work with, I'm definitely gonna go read up on it. So the same thing if someone comes from a different cultural background, um, I think it's important to, to start to learn about that culture and that background. And that might mean stepping outside of your comfort zone. And you know, I know in graduate school, we had to like go to a church or go to different environments. We had to buy like greeting cards um, with someone of a different culture and send it. So like doing some of those things where you're immersing yourself in the culture, I think can be, 
extremely important, especially right now where I think our, our country is talking about some of the differences that exist. Yes. Yeah. Well, I really thank you for being here today. As yeah. is your, you know, very open with us and I appreciate that. Absolutely. So, um, I look forward to seeing you again in the future, Dr. Norwood. Absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for everything you all are doing. Um, if you want to keep up with me, yes, please feel free to follow me on Instagram. And I look forward to seeing you next month. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>